Howdy partner. Before we start today's video, I just wanted to let you know that we have something special available for the holiday season. Over on our Patreon, we have an album of Christmas songs inspired by this video series. If you've enjoyed the music in these videos about Knott's Berry Farm history, especially those about the 1940s and 50s, this album is right up your alley. It features all these songs, all for only $10. Oh, and patrons get the album free as a thank you for their support. The Theme Park I've Berry Merry Christmas album is available through the link at the top of your screen and a link in the video description below. You have a happy holidays, and now, on with the video. By the early 1960s, Knott's Berry Farm was officially a theme park, at least using the definition we developed on this channel. And while Walter Knott's focus shifted away from the park he'd been building for two decades, he still retained the final say in anything new. Nothing got done without Walter's approval, but he was getting to an age where this was no longer feasible. So he turned the business over to his daughter, and with that, a new era of Knott's Berry Farm began. We avoided mentioning it last episode, but it's worth pointing out that the Vietnam War, simmering since late 1955, was finally boiling over. U.S. involvement escalated slowly over those first several years, but August 1964 is the point where the United States' role went from conflict level to all-out war. This just happens to coincide with the launch of Walter Knott's Independence Hall project, the last major project he oversaw on the farm. And by the time Walter turned over control of the park to his daughter Marion, the U.S. was entering what would become its bloodiest year of the war. Anti-war protests were already common, but now they would become a central issue in American politics. That's not to mention the Tet Offensive in Vietnam, the Soviet Union's invasion and occupation of Czechoslovakia, the assassinations of both Martin Luther King Jr. and Robert Kennedy, the violent confrontations between police and protesters at the Democratic National Convention in Chicago, and the election of Richard Nixon, all of which happened during that same year. And while Northern California had the Haight-Ashbury area and Berkeley and the reputation as the center of the hippie universe, Southern California still had Laurel Canyon, Hollywood, and several universities dotting the landscape. And in just another year, it would have the Manson murders. It's important to keep this time period in mind when looking at Marion Knott's first major decision as head of the park. She wanted to put up a fence and enclose Knott's berry farm, something her father had resisted for years. Her reasoning, as she expressed it to the Orange County Register at the time, was, quote, We had to put up the gate because we were losing it to the hippies. Walter's worry about installing a fence was understandable. Customers had visited the farm for nearly 40 years at this point. Some had come for chicken dinners all the way back when the food was still being prepared in Cordelia's home kitchen. They'd seen the growth of the ghost town from one small street to an entire theme park. They knew the Knott family and many of their longtime employees by name. They came and square danced every Sunday at the wagon camp. They'd brought their kids over the years, as they'd grown into adults and started bringing kids of their own. Heck, some of them even attended church every Sunday at the Church of Reflections with the Knott family. Putting up a wall and charging those folks admission felt like charging friends to come over to your house. But that mindset just goes to show how out of touch Walter had become with the park's business in the last several years. He even admitted five years ago, in a 1963 interview, that he wasn't very involved in the day-to-day -day operations at the park anymore. He then spent the following years focused squarely on his Independence Hall and Freedom Center across the street. What Walter didn't know was that some of those loyal customers he worried about losing had already given up on Knott's Berry Farm, 
refusing to come back because the park no longer felt safe for them or their families. A man that knew this all too well was Wendell Bud Hurlbut. The fact that Bud Hurlbut of all people was such a big proponent of the fence and admission fee is indicative of how bad it really got. Ostensibly, he stood to lose the most, money-wise, if attendance dropped like Walter worried. Sure, he could negotiate to pay the Knots less rent on his concessions, since they would get more of the customer's dollar with the new admission fee, but if the crowds dropped to where he couldn't even afford to run his concessions, he'd be out of business. The Knots would still own the land, and the park, no matter how small the crowds got. The real difference was, Bud knew the fence needed to happen, because unlike Walter, he was still working in the park day to day. It's hard to say exactly when the shift occurred, but at some point during the mid to late 1960s, the crowds coming to Knott's Berry Farm changed. Once, it had been families visiting. Now, groups of teenagers roamed the park, not spending money at any of the concessions, just sitting around at best and taunting or harassing other patrons at worst. Sometimes this resulted in fistfights, and more often than not, the miscreants ran away right as staff arrived to see what caused the commotion. These teens might pay to go on the Calico Mine Ride, but then would jump out of their carts and mess with the miners or displays. Often they brought drugs or alcohol into the park, and consumed them publicly in front of the families. Thefts weren't unheard of, nor was vandalism in the park or parking lot. Of particular target were single women and young girls. So when Bud Hurlbut's secretary came to him one afternoon, sobbing, and told him about an incident she had with her teenage daughter walking through the park, he took her to tell the story to Mr. Knott. As Walter listened to the woman talk about how a group of teens harassed the two of them, he turned pale. He didn't say anything, but a few weeks later, Marion's new fence went up without any resistance from Walter. So how bad was the situation in the park, really? And were the perpetrators really hippies? It's hard to say, but given the generally agreed-upon, non-sensationalized account of the yippie powwow at Disneyland a couple years later, which of course deserves its own episode one day, it's certainly plausible that these kind of things were happening, and that hippie types were involved. Disney, having a gate, kept an unwritten policy for years regarding visitor dress code. People that looked suspicious were monitored, and those dressed inappropriately for a family environment were asked to change clothes or leave. People that were visibly high or drunk were turned away outright. Anyone was welcome, but the second they started acting in a way that wasn't family-friendly, they were escorted out, usually by large, strong-looking security staff, many of whom were off-duty or retired police. By comparison... Knott's Berry Farm security was run by Walter's grandson, Stephen Knott, son of Russell. And though 34 of their 90 security employees were deputized by the Orange County Sheriff, meaning they technically had legal authority to enforce the law, the Knott's security team was a private enterprise. By the late 1960s, the Sheriff's Office debuted their new Special Deputy Program, which limited the legal authority available to the deputized members of Knott's security, though they still wore an official Orange County Sheriff uniform and patch. Their jobs mainly consisted of reuniting lost children with parents, traffic and parking control, minor first aid assistance, overseeing money transit between offices, helping stuck motorists with car trouble, fire prevention and firefighting, and giving out information. Chasing down and apprehending miscreants wasn't really part of the job. Also unlike Disneyland, Knott's Berry Farm didn't have walls surrounding it. Knott's Berry Farm didn't have an official entrance. Knott's Berry Farm did have an informal 10pm curfew, after which concessions closed and guests were encouraged to leave. But kicking someone out of Knott's wasn't really practical. They could just leave and go to the opposite side of the park to re-enter. This made keeping the park secure an impractical game of whack-a-mole. While the decision to wall off the park may have upset some, most people just went along with the new system. 
In fact, the park's attendance actually grew, a testament to how the crowds had declined toward the end of Walter's management when people felt less safe. Marianne Knott later said, quote, Once we put in the enclosure, that made us an amusement park. She said this to justify expanding the park, but that excuse seems unnecessary. Walter Knott had always known the value of adding new attractions to the park, but his age and the worsening effects of Parkinson's disease made it impossible for him to keep up with. Problem was, he just refused to give up control. He even tried adding a new audio attraction on Main Street in the summer of 68, using a similar system to the audio in the Declaration Room for his replica Independence Hall. But it failed miserably. No one paid any attention to it, and it got ripped out by the end of the season. That was Walter Knott's last direct involvement in a project in the park, though he was still consulted for his thoughts on later additions. Meanwhile, Marion and Bud Hurlbut were consulting on two major projects. The first was an extensive retheme and expansion of the area between the Church of Reflections and the merry go round This became Fiesta Village, themed to the Spanish colonial era of California's history. They renamed the pond to Lake of Flowers, the petting zoo to Escuela de Animales, and Hurlbut's car ride to Tijuana Taxi. Over the next two years, a few flat rides were added, including a teacup-style ride designed by Hurlbut and his buddies over aero development. This new land was the first area to break from the strict Old West theme of the rest of the park, but with the model missions lining the main path connecting Fiesta Village back to Ghost Town, it still felt like a natural fit for the park. The second major project was to be Hurlbut's second masterpiece. Right across from his Calico Mine Ride, would be his Calico Log Ride. Seriously, I love how bland and direct Hurlbut's ride names are. The Log Ride would utilize a new ride system sold by Aero Developments, first seen at Six Flags Over Texas in 1963. Back then, Walter wouldn't hear of it and rejected the ride idea. But once the Texas version proved reliable, he let Hurlbut explore the idea. The version in Texas wasn't themed, but Knott's Berry Farm needed to compete with Disneyland. So Hurlbut designed an attraction to showcase the story of the lumber industry in the 1800s, much like the mine ride did for mining. He used many of the same tricks on the new ride as well, taking riders past scenes of life for laborers in the 19th century. The log ride's mountain was roughly the same size as the mine rides, but the splashdown area almost doubled its footprint. Hurlbut spent $3.5 million building the ride. That's equivalent to $31 million today. The park went all out for the grand opening. Actor John Wayne was a friend of the Knott family for years and was a business partner of Virginia's husband. One day, while visiting the park's offices, he was admiring the ride's design. Bud Hurlbut asked him if he wanted to be the first to ride it. Wayne agreed, and acted as both Master of Ceremonies for the event, and was the first public rider that day with his son, Ethan. A brief power outage caused a minor panic for Hurlbut and his team, until it turned out it was a local blackout and not a problem with the ride. Power came back shortly after, and the excited crowds, including a young local man named Tony Baxter, got to experience the ride. Nine days after Calico Log Ride's grand opening, Neil Armstrong became the first person to walk on the moon. It seemed Marion's new direction for the park was working well, and thus she started looking to truly expand the park. Fiesta Village and the Log Ride only reworked land that wasn't being used to its full extent. Disneyland had been the vanguard of a new wave of theme and amusement parks, two of which were close enough to cause real concern, Universal Studios and Magic Mountain. To compete, Knott's Berry Farm needed to truly expand both in size and in the variety of experiences it offered. But Marion consistently struggled to find a theme. Fiesta Village shared a basis in California history with the ghost town, which both expanded the park's overall theme and kept its original character. Whatever the new area was, in Marion's mind, it had to fit the same way. It had to be rooted in California history. Looking back, 
It's kind of funny how much this bothered her when less than 10 miles up the road, Disneyland had a spaceman standing next to a princess, next to a cowboy, next to a bunch of talking birds. I mean, how much realism did theme park guests truly want? But Marion wanted the park to remain cohesive, true to her father's original vision. Problem was, only one theme kept coming to Marion's mind, a theme that wouldn't age well. The Gypsy Camp started construction in 1970 and would feature a four-story mountain with caves hiding shops, an arcade called the Thieves' Den, and a restaurant. Peek-in tableau and walk-around characters, much like over in Ghost Town, completed the land. The centerpiece was a new, large, indoor theater. A promised thrill ride never made it off the drawing board. The theater was the important bit. The Wagon Camp stage had been cute when it was built, but the area only sat 800 people. Drawing major country and western acts to play the park was hard, especially when the venue was outdoors, and thus weather restricted. Knots required more seats, an enclosed space, and modern theater infrastructure like lighting and amplification. They got family friend John Wayne to lend his name to the theater, and its first event was to host the world premiere of Wayne's new film, Big Jake, on June 19, 1971. Hollywood celebrities attended the event with former Western star and current California governor Ronald Reagan giving Walter and Cordelia a personal letter from President Richard Milhouse Nixon congratulating them on their recent 60th wedding anniversary. At least the theater, if not the land around it, was a success. The biggest problem with the gypsy camp was that it kinda sucked. Setting the dumpster fire conversation of its name aside, it just wasn't fun. There were no rides. The theater might have been successful for its purpose, but it only mattered if there was a big show going on. The shops might have been charming, but they were hidden and hard to find. The only part of the area that held any draw for average guests was the arcade. Even the rock work on the fake mountain looked bad, especially compared to the other places in the park with fake rock that looked pretty freaking good. The panning for gold area, the calico mine ride, and the calico log ride. If the Mark Smith Horseshoe Arena was Walter's Folly, I think it's more than fair to call Gypsy Camp Marion's Folly. The next couple years were quiet for the park with only small changes to existing attractions, such as another expansion to the Steakhouse restaurant. That is, except for October 1973, with the addition of a nighttime event over the weekend before Halloween. Dubbed the Halloween Haunt by Martha Boyd of the marketing department, the event was largely driven by the park's employees and concessionaires with the approval of Marion Knott. Boyd, along with fellow marketing department employee George Condos and the entertainment department's Bill Hollingshead, arranged for a separate ticketed event with unlimited access to all the park's rides. Remember, this was back when the park was still charging per ride. The Haunted Shack became the Monster Maze, and one of Hurlbut's men filled the Calico Mine and Log rides with spooky props. Unsatisfied with the results of this redecorating on his rides, Hurlbut put on a gorilla suit and climbed up into the mine with a ticket taker. He had the girl distract riders while he snuck up behind them and scared them. After that first night, he asked the other operation managers to get him 35 people for the next two nights. He stashed these newly minted characters in various hiding places along his two rides and had them scare riders as he'd done on that first night. The event was so successful, it was revived the following year where every single night sold out, and continued to sell to 20% beyond the park's traditionally accepted capacity. Fifty years later, Knott's Scary Farm, as the event is now called, stands as the first in a trend that every single theme or amusement park, regardless of size, seems to have. A Halloween haunt. But not everything was good news on the farm. In April 1974, at the age of 84, Cordelia Knott passed away in the house behind the chicken dinner restaurant. In the 40 years since she'd started selling them, her chicken dinner restaurant had sold more than 30 million dinners. She'd overseen the expansion of all the restaurants in the park, 
making sure they met her exacting standards. And every single fool idea Walter got into his head, he'd had to run by Cordy. The entire Knotts organization mourned her, and her passing inspired her daughter to honor her memory. To Marion Knotts' credit, she didn't wait around for almost a decade, like her father had, to fix her mistake. In 1975, a new land would debut, taking over the former spot of Marion's Folly, and it would become one of the most popular expansions to Knott's Berry Farm in its history. She'd been thinking about it almost since that first season, after lines for the John Wayne Theater reached all the way into Ghost Town, because the lobby was too small for the theater's capacity. But now, she knew what she wanted, and it was going to mark a shift in the park's overall theme. Hey friends, thanks for watching all the way to the end of this video. Here's a couple more you might like, and if you would, please hit the subscribe button and the thumbs up. It literally costs you nothing except a few seconds, and it truly helps us make more videos like this one. An extra special thanks go out to the people helping us over on Patreon. It's because of their support that you're seeing this video right now. If you want to help the channel out even more, head over to our Patreon and check it out. You can find it through a link in the description. Thanks again for watching, and we hope you have a great day.